Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for um, these uh, great conversations um, that we had in the breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes hearing from each group about what some of the highlights and takeaways were from each discussion. Um, is Nadia back in yet? Hi, Nadia. Do you, do you want to go first and, and give us an sure. overview of your group? Sure. Well, we were a small but mighty group. Um, and we discussed a little bit, you know, the current um, state of of play in New York and the fact that um, New York continues as we were discussing in the body of the of this event too, you know, continues to expand and build out um, compressor stations and other infrastructure and continues to have a very high gas consumption level. Uh, but at the same time, under its climate laws and other policies that are underway, like a green amendment, similar to what Pennsylvania has. So as those processes are underway, um, what are the opportunities to leverage health data and, and to bring that to bear? Um, so we, we had a couple of ideas, um, and one of them um, is, of course, going back to the, the longstanding um, process of having public, you know, whenever there's a public hearing or comment period, using health data, making sure that that's integrated in what communities are arguing for. Um, another thought was that, and this would be more work for EHP, but it would be a very, I think, um, positive um, step for EHP to take is to start um, facilitating more communication among its cohorts as, those, as the number of cohorts grows in New York so that people are able to share information and new cohorts might become interested in engaging in the program. Um, so that the data, for example, from Borger, what we heard about today, all of the work that EHB um, and Mothers Out Front have done could get out to new people um, in a more concerted way. And I think uh, Patrick took notes on, on the other details of that idea, um, but really enable information sharing. Um, and then uh, there was a little bit of discussion about the status of talking directly to the DEC as they contemplate permits and as these processes are underway and um, a little reminiscing about back in the day in the early days of um, shale gas development, there were a lot of hearings and a lot of meetings with DEC, but the sense that everybody has is that that's not um, happening as much anymore. Um, so that's an avenue to explore. You know, let, there's a legislative level of policy and then there's the regulatory level. Um, and then um, speaking of regulation, New York passed um, final regulations to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas um, a few years ago, and that was running parallel to the finalization of the rules by the EPA. And so there was some interest in following up on that and figuring out um, how those rules are being brought to bear around these compressor station expansions and whether they are considering um, some of the data that EHP has, or whether EHP would 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 find an opening with the regulatory again with DC um, as they implement those rules, and there might be gaps um, for community advocates to consider. And I think I'll stop there. That's and great, Nadia. Thank if you, Amy Rosemarin or Amy Panic or Patrick had anything to add or how we're doing on time, but that's uh, we it out. we are coming up very quickly. Okay, the then I'll time. stop talking. <laughs> but thank you. It sounds like you had a fantastic conversation mm -hmm. um, over in the health and wellness uh, breakout group. Um, we had a small but mighty group as well. Um, a lot of different perspectives uh, from climate engagement to engineering and, and the professional sector and also um, in healthcare. Uh, we had two RNs um, in the group as well. And um, you know, just at a high level, we um, we saw themes around difficulty in engaging people in the issue, but then also keeping them engaged over a, a considerable amount of time. Um, you know, there was a sense that um, oftentimes people don't get interested in a subject until they are directly impacted by it, um, and that a lot of 
the work that is being done um, to create standards, to create regulations can obscure what's actually happening and um, give people a false sense of comfort. Um, and also that um, because of that false sense of comfort, health might not be the most effective way to start an engagement um, with, with a community unless their health is already being impacted. Uh, but, um, climate is um, often getting more attention and more traction um, in in creating movement um, for for people before their health is impacted, uh, which ultimately, you know, in in the role of a public health organization, we want to be um, interacting with people and protecting people before they are impacted by by a given risk. Um, so really, we heard a lot of calls for. Um, even doing climate mitigation um, and making sure that um, if we're extracting less fossil fuel from the ground, uh, people are gonna be impacted by it less, but also um, better engagement among um, health professionals, particularly nurses, um, to be getting involved in these efforts and, and educating them um, on ways that they can speak with and um, better engage their patients on these subjects. Um, and since we are um, rapidly approaching the end of the time, I will leave it there and hand it over to Nathan for a recap from the uh, data collection and analysis group. Thanks, Allison. Uh, I will be quick. We had uh, a larger yet still mighty group. Um, we had a lot of folks uh, sharing their thoughts, which I greatly appreciated. Uh, people in our group were, you know, interested in, in monitoring specifically in a wide array of contexts, which uh, I found interesting and exciting, uh, you know, from quantifying the impact of green infrastructure projects to identifying pollutants from heavy industry impacting nearby residents, but pollutants that aren't showing up on existing monitors um, and, and measuring PFAS both in air and water uh, where, where that's an issue. We also uh, discussed the impact of um, expansions to aging pipelines, uh, including the associated expansion of uh, compressor stations and uh, safety concerns around the increase in gas movement uh, through those pipelines. And, you know, I, I, at the end, we, we discussed differing approaches to advocacy, which, uh, you know, was uh, something that I think we all deal with in, and wrestle with. Namely, you know, do we work to ensure expansion or a new project doesn't happen? Or do we work to ensure that any expansion that does happen is done with the greatest protections possible? Um, not that we came to a, a determination that one is the way to go, but rather that um, you know both of these are uh, good tools to have in the toolbox. So uh, that's a, a high level summary of what we went over. Thank you so much, Nathan. And thank you once again to everybody for uh, participating in these discussions. Um, everything that you shared today is helping the, the rest of the group, not just DHP, but all of us get a better sense of how public health efforts can be more effective moving forward. Uh, so we can't thank you enough. Um, and on that note, I, uh, as we wrap up, I would like to uh, thank once again, our partners over at Grassroots Environmental Education. Uh, thank you so much for being a fantastic partner and co-hosting this event. Uh, thank you to our presenters today, Nathan, Taylor, and Stu for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thank you to Nadia and Nathan for facilitating breakout discussions and everybody on the EHP team working behind the scenes the whole time to ensure the seamless flow of information between speakers and attendees across multiple sessions. We could not have done this without you. Um, very special thanks to the Park Foundation for their generous support and helping to make this event possible. And once again, uh, to all of you, uh, this event would not have happened without all of you attending and making this subject a, a priority in your own work. Thank you.